Would you join me for a word of prayer as we get started in our worship service this morning? Gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time, this time we gather together, a time of experiencing your grace and your mercy and your love. We pray that our hearts would be enriched and strengthened and we would be reminded as our faith is strengthened of who you are and how much you love us. Use this time, Father, to be exalted and glorified in all that you say and do. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Chelsea? All right. Will you all please stand as we begin to worship? And I want to read something real quick to you that I thought was very encouraging. It says, sometimes we feel discouraged because we are not more of something. So like more spiritual, more respected, intelligent, healthy, rich, all the above. But we don't need to be more of anything to start to become the person God intended us to become. God will take you as you are at this very moment and begin to work within you. So I think that was very encouraging of you are who you are and God is working with who you are now. So let's begin to worship.
Well, good morning, folks. I'm going to stay down here this morning. How's that? Okay. Some of you are excited about it. Some of you are scared. I'm not sure which. That's all right. I'm not going to go there. Uh, if you have your copy of God's Word, go ahead and turn to Philippians chapter 4. We're going to finish up Philippians today. Uh, so it'll be an interesting encounter. It's been an interesting kind of, Just kind of a reminder, I don't know if you're familiar with your calendars. I don't know if you know what tomorrow is. Uh, probably the most significant day on the Jewish calendar. No, it's not Passover. It is Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. That was a day, and if you want to look, learn more about it, I'd ch- ask you to check out uh, Leviticus 16, kind of lays out the rules uh, for what they were due to the celebration, but it's where the term scapegoat, ever heard of a scapegoat? That's where the term comes from, is this actual event that took place as a celebration in Jewish history of God's forgiveness. They would sacrifice a lamb for the sins of the people after the priest would pray over the sins, and then he would pray over the sins of the people and, conf- in a sense, like, and then lay them on this goat that they would then release into the wilderness, and that was the scapegoat. And so that's what we sell it tomorrow. And I don't know if they're going to do that in Israel. Hopefully somewhere they will, but that's, the, that's where that comes from. That is a significant, very significant holiday in the Jewish uh, tradition, but also for us as believers in Jesus Christ and believers in the Bible, that reminds us of the incredible sacrifice that our Savior gave for us so that we can celebrate Him and what He's done in our lives, the forgiveness that He offers us uh, by taking our sins and removing us as far as the east is from the west, removing them from us as far as the east is from the west. But that's, a, that's free. That's not really part of the message. That's just a freebie, okay? That's my public service announcement for today. All right, let's go ahead. If you have your copy of God's Word, we're going to look at Philippians 4, verses 10 through 23. If you're able, stand with us in honor of reading God's Word this morning. Philippians 4, verses 10 through 23, as we finish out the chapter of this work that Paul writes for us. And the apostle says, But I rejoice greatly, in the Lord greatly, that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my affliction. You yourselves also know, Philippians, that at first, preaching of the, the first preaching of the gospel after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, but you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. Not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek for the profit which increases to your account. But I have received everything in full and have an abundance. I am amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what was you sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren who are with me greet you. All saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the testimony of the apostle as he speaks to us today. I pray, Father, that as we spend some time in your word today, the Holy Spirit would continue to empower us, speak to us, and enable us, Father, to truly hear what you are saying to us today. I believe you have a word for us in the midst of the circumstances in which we find ourselves. And more importantly, Father, I believe you have a word for us in the days ahead that you have given us. Bless this time and use it. May you be exalted in all that is said and done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. All right. As we said, I said, we're winding down. This is the end of the Philippians uh, that I've been preaching, the book of Philippians. A lot of things have been uh, done in this. And this has got one of those verses that's very well known. 
uh, in 413, but very, uh, how shall I say this in a kind way, misquoted and misinterpreted. Uh, I've seen it on a lot of posters that are nice, and uh, the one I remember is of a cat reaching up. I can do all things, and he's trying to get, I don't know if he's trying to get food or what, you know. I don't really think this verse is about a cat trying to get a toy. But anyway, I think it's about something more significant. We're going to kind of unpack that for you here in just a few moments just to kind of look at it. Because I think this is a, a very powerful text that teaches us a lot about what we are to expect as followers of Christ and where God will take us and how God can use us and where we find our strength and our sustenance in Him. And I hope you find uh, what God says to you today as being something that pushes you forward and gives you strength. Because I would say we're in a little bit of an uncertain time in our lives. Would you agree with that in our culture? Uh, I'm going to ask a question. How many of you are tired of masks? That's kind of unanimous. That, yeah, I think, think we could run on that campaign platform. I think so, yeah. Uh, but, and we're tired of them. And we're, tired, we're just tired probably of all the stuff that we've dealt with over the last several months as all this kind of has kind of worn on us. And I understand that. And we all are dealing with it. But understand this, that God is in control and God knows what he's doing. And even in spite of that, God is still at work. Did you know that God didn't quit doing what God was doing just because of a little pandemic? God's still God. He's still in control. And that's what we're going to look at here because Paul was going through a time, as many of you know, the book of Philippians, which is kind of interesting. If they, they did a poll. They've done it before. And they do it every now and then. What is the most encouraging book that Paul wrote? That's it. Philippians. It wins hands down every time as the most encouraging. And probably it's because of 413. That's one of the most well-known, you know, everybody, that's, you know, that's, that's encouraging. And yet it was written when he was in jail. The apostle had been given the command, as we've talked about this before, to take the gospel to the ends of the earth and to share the gospel with Gentiles, with people who are not Jewish, of which I am and many of you are as well. And I'm very grateful for the apostle's ministry and mission that he was faithful to fulfill. And yet I can't help but wonder as he was in that jail cell and, you know, hanging out there and trying to figure out, God, you told me to do this. And yet it's not getting done. I'm here. I'm stuck. Anybody ever felt stuck before in their life? All of us have. We've had moments where we think, you know, God, I know you want me to do this. I know you've called me to do something, but why is it working this way? This is not the way that I have planned. And yet God always has a plan. And I would dare say that the Apostle Paul's reach uh, for the ministry that God called him to as a missionary to share the gospel far as that far expanded anything he ever dreamed of. I mean, I don't even know if he knew that, that we, this part of the world existed. He didn't know much about Northern Europe. He knew most about the Roman Empire where he lived. They knew a little bit about it. That was kind of where the barbarians lived up in, you know, Northern Europe and France and England and those parts of the world where many of us are from. So he really didn't know a lot about that. He had no idea about North America, I'm pretty sure, and South America and that parts of the world. All those things were probably things that were foreign to him as he was studying. And, and, and he was sailing around the Mediterranean there uh, doing the mission work God had called him to do with, and, and doing those things. And yet, probably wondering, was it really making a difference? And here we are 2,000 years later almost, looking at the words that he penned while stuck in prison and understanding the great principles. So I wanted us to get that. We've kind of looked at this the last several weeks, but I really want us to, to think about what God is able to accomplish even when things don't go according to our plans. And I've learned something in my brief years on planet earth in my time as a follower of Christ, that oftentimes God does the most amazing things that God does in and through the life that I've been given. But he doesn't do it the way I would have him do it. Anybody else ever experienced that? He often does things in ways that I don't expect. He often accomplishes things in ways that I thought, you know, well, God, if I were to plan it, you know, but God never asked my opinion. Did you ever ask anybody else's? He never asked me what I think. He just asked me to do and be faithful to him. And that's the call that we all have as followers of Christ in our life. So as Paul is struggling with this, he kind of, as he starts this out in these first few verses, he says, he's talking about his concern for the church of Philippi. He has a great love for this church. And you'll kind of get to why here in just a few, few verses. He said, you know, I'm grateful you were, you were, you've revived your concern for me. You've given to me. You've shown support to me. But I, I don't have any wants or needs. This is a guy in jail. And he said, I don't have any wants or needs. Now, if I were in jail... I think I'd have some wants and needs. How about you? Like real food would probably be one of them. Freedom, a lot of things, you know, just, a, a lot, but he says nothing. I, I don't speak from want, he says in verse 11. And this second half is one of those things. For I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. Anybody ever struggle with contentment in your circumstances? 
besides me? It's a challenge sometimes, isn't it? Sometimes we focus more on where we're going to be than where we are. Anybody else ever deal with that? Sometimes as churches we do this, sometimes as believers we do this, we kind of, we're more, we're more, you know, well, one day we'll do this. And, and there's nothing wrong with looking to one day, but sometimes we need to be content with who we are and who God has called us to be and how God can use us where he has placed us. Because sometimes it's in the middle of the muck and the mire and the mess of the life where we find ourselves that God is able to do what only God can do in and through us. Because he accomplishes what he's able to accomplish, sometimes not because of us, but sometimes in spite of us. You ever been there? Seems like I'm there about every other day. God's able to do things and accomplish things. And Paul was probably, and though he's stuck in prison, though he can't do the things he feels led to do, he's not preaching, he's not out amongst the people doing what he felt God called him to do, he is trying to be faithful and trying to focus on what God has called him to do. And he understands in the middle of all that that even though he has all this, he doesn't have everything he wants, he knows that God is able to accomplish what God is able to accomplish. And he has learned to be content wherever he finds himself. Now, content doesn't mean a smug self-satisfaction where I don't care about anybody else. It means I'm content and I'm grateful for what God has given me in these moments. That's what he's talking about here. My hope and prayer for each of us today and in the days ahead is that we learn that Christ-like contentment, that spiritual contentment that Paul is talking about here, we understand that even though things aren't going according to plan, even though things may appear a little chaotic, God is still in control, God still loves us, and God still has a purpose and plan for your life. Some days you feel more loved by God than others, don't you? You know, some days we feel closer to God than others. We feel more in tune. And a lot of times, we, if we're not careful, we can allow our circumstances, our lives, to dictate our feelings about our faith. And that's the danger, is feelings and faith don't always tell the truth. Have, you ever noticed, have your feelings ever lied to you? What's, well, I know it's quiet because everybody's got their mask on. But anyway, feelings lie, don't they? And those of you that are not old enough to understand this yet, you know, you may have been in that process in life when you are uh, looking for someone you want to spend some time with, and you feel like that person's the right person, and over time you realize that was a mistake. Anybody ever been there? Oh, yeah. I heard that. <laughs> you know, that happens. You know, whether it's friendships or whether it's that person that you hope to spend the rest of your life with or wherever it is, there are sometimes we make those and we rely on feelings. Anybody ever get caught up in feelings in a, in a game or a sporting event? Oh, come on. Really? I'm the only person in this room that roots for a particular sports team. Sure, yeah, whatever. Maybe that particular team, sure. But we all have our, you know, we get excited about them, and we, and we get, get all, my wife would testify, I have my issues, and I get all caught up sometimes. And you know the emotion of a game, you know, where you think it's going to go this way or that way, and you get all, oh, you know, you get all, why do we do that? We do that in life too, don't we? We get circumstances come our way, things come our way that, that we don't think are going to work out, and we're like, oh, what's going to happen here? And we get all worked up and worried that it's not going to work out. And yet, has God lost control in that moment? No. Has God ceased to love us or care less about us? And think, I don't care about Mike today. I'm just going to let him float around and see what happens. No. Nope. We perceive it that way, the enemy likes to convince us that that's the way it is, but that is a lie. That is not truth. God knows, and what Paul is trying to express to these Philippians is that God knows where you are, just like he knows where I'm at. No matter where I find myself, I know I can be content because God is with me, God loves me, God cares, and I have a mission, and I will accomplish the mission that God wants to accomplish with my life. What incredible testimony that Paul shares with us here, even in the middle of difficult circumstances. Why, probably, I believe this book is so... Uh, encouraging and significant in the lives and hearts of so many believers around the world because of what he was going through, because of the difficulty he was facing, and yet he learned that secret. And see, that's the core of it. That's really what he's talking about in verse 13. He's not talking about anything else like sports or, you know, that. He's talking about no matter what I find in life, no matter how hard it gets, no matter how difficult it is, I know I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. God will accomplish what God wants to do in and through my life as I walk with him no matter what I face. That's the, that's the context of the verse, which is important. 
And really, it fits in the entire book of Philippians, which I think it fits really in the entire gospel of Jesus Christ in the New Testament, and even the Old as well. We see this again and again working out, where people are going through situations and circumstances that they never wanted or expected, and yet God is faithful. Have you ever experienced a time in your life when you didn't think it was working the way it was supposed to, and then after it was over in hindsight, you're like, oh, well, I see what God did. Anybody ever had that? Yeah. It happens. I think that's the Holy Spirit's all along trying to encourage us, but sometimes we don't listen as well. Maybe you don't have that problem, but I have that problem where I don't listen to God's Spirit as well as I should sometimes and allow God to really help me understand that. But that's what I think Paul grasped in ways that a lot of us didn't. He understood that it was all about God and God's supply and not about my circumstances. Not about what I see, but what God is able to do. What he is able to provide for us. That no matter what I face in my life, Jesus is enough. If I find myself on the mountaintop celebrating and having a good time, Jesus is enough. If I find myself in the deepest, darkest hole on planet Earth, wondering if I'm going to see another day, Jesus is enough. No matter where I find myself, he is enough. That's why Paul can say these things in verse 13 and then go on to say in verse 14, nevertheless, he compliments the Philippians again, you have done well to share with me in my affliction. Thank you for sharing with me. He's really bragging on this church here, isn't he? And I don't know if we understand, you know, it's sometimes hard, but let me give you a little historical context, not to bore you, but to help you understand why it is significant, why everybody else had quit supporting Paul's mission and only the Philippians had. There was a time in that part of the world when Paul was doing his ministry that the the world went through a really serious issue with with drought and and a lot of poverty was taking place in the empire. There was a lot of horrible things going on and people were just, didn't have it. It it was just a difficult time. It's kind of like today, people are struggling. And they were were missing those kind of things that they needed and they couldn't provide and so they had forgotten Paul off in the, doing his thing out there in the Mediterranean, going to these different places and starting churches and they'd forgotten to support him and encourage him and pray for him. But the Philippian church remembered. And I don't know how much they sent, and that's not the issue to him. It's not, it, it wasn't like he had, I need a goal. He didn't have a, you know, a, a fundraising goal or anything like that. He just said, whatever you send, fine. God blessed him with that. And he just wanted to let them know he was grateful for that, that God had used them in that way. But also not so much for his sake that he got the money. That wasn't what it was about, or the resources. But for their blessing, that they had been a part of what he was doing. And God was going to bless them for their faithfulness. And as I love what he says there, he says that they blessed it on you. It was for your account, he says down in verse 17. I'm, it's not a profit that increases for me, but that increases on your account. I'm grateful for you, for your faithfulness, he tells these believers. Are we mindful and grateful for the things that God has done in our lives when God has shown up when no one else has shown up? When God has accomplished what no one else could accomplish. When even though it looked hopeless, he came through. He does that a lot. Rarely gets credit for it. But he does, doesn't he? And Paul was experiencing that in his own life here. And he wanted to express that to these believers. That God could do what only God can do because God is able and God loves us. God is, is faithful to us. And really, that's all he asks of us. Did you know that? You know what God wants? You know, people want to know that. What's the, what does God want from me? He wants you to be faithful. Be faithful. To trust him and be faithful. Best you can. He's not telling you, I want these results. He doesn't have it all mapped out. I want you to do this, this, and this, and this. We do that, you know. We've got this, this is the plan for our life. This is how my life's going to have influence. I'm going to do these 14 things, and eventually I'm going to get here, and it's all going to go well. Because we have this vision of life, that life is like a slow incline. And you just keep going up, and everything goes well, and you do this, and you check this box, and this box, and you're going here and here. And then I'm here, and I've made it. I've made it to the mountaintop. I've accomplished all I dreamed. But have you ever noticed that life doesn't work that way? How many of you notice that sometimes you're going along, and then something happens? Wheel falls off, maybe. I don't know. Or something worse, something, so health changes. Something in our lives causes an alteration in our plans. We all have that. We face that. And so the journey changes a little bit. And life is like that for every one of us. We are on a path that God has for us. God knows the path. Only God knows the path. 
God knows what he can do in and through your life and how he will use your life. He knows how your life can be used to influence others for the sake of the kingdom. But what you and I have to do is trust him on that journey because sometimes it's going to look like when you're following God that God does not know what he's doing. There have been many times in my walk and in my life, in ministry especially, and Debbie and I, as we've walked this road together for a long time, 30 plus years. She stuck with me for a long time. I'm really excited about that. Be married 35 years next May, so that's pretty good. Nobody else has stuck with me that long, so I'm glad. But uh, there have been days and challenges and times we wondered, are we on the path that God wants? And it doesn't always you know what I, what I get frustrated about entertainment and television? That always, they do sitcoms where they work out all these world's problems in 23 minutes. Have you noticed that? And they always deal with a smile on their face. No matter what they're going through. Now, if it's one of those hour dramas, which is really about, what, 48 minutes, something like that. I don't know what it is. I mean, with commercials. They get all the world's problems solved. And they solve all these things. And they, you know, solve all these issues that nobody can solve in 48 minutes. Don't you wish life worked that way? But life doesn't work that way. And sometimes you and I face those challenges in life. We wonder, God, when, when's the solution going to come? When's that, oh, we done, we've made it, thank you. Well, I'd love to have news for you and tell you that it's going to be this many steps, but I don't have that news for you today because that would be a lie. Can I be honest? It would be unbiblical. It would not be what the teachings of the gospel teach. It wouldn't be the evidence in the, in the life of the Apostle Paul that we've been reading about today and look over the last several weeks. It wouldn't be even in the life of our Savior Jesus that everything work out rosy for him on that Friday when he was beat with a cat of nine tails and then hung on a wooden cross. Did that work out well physically? Think about that. That's a pretty bad day. Worked out really well for us. Better than we can even imagine. I can't even fully quantify how amazing and how wonderful those moments were for what it accomplished for us. Now, to watch that and to see that, I don't know if you've seen The Passion of the Christ that came out years ago, but that is one of the hardest movies to watch I have ever seen in my life. It's a great movie, powerful story, but watching that is gut-wrenching. Anybody else had that feeling when they saw it? I mean, it rips your core. I mean, it's just hard to watch because that's what sin does to us. And that's what was necessary to remove the penalty of sin from us was what Jesus accomplished for us. And folks, that movie, though it dramatizes it, really isn't even close to how awful it was. It can't capture everything because it's just a dramatization. It's, and it's, and it's, you know, realize that was a couple of hours. You realize this lasted all day. The flogging of Jesus himself probably lasted more. They, did, they hit him more than 40 times. These were Romans, not Jews hitting him. They didn't care about, you know, only doing 39 lashes to make sure. They, they just beat him till they were, they were satisfied. Basically till they were tired. Then they quit. All the things that our Savior endured for us. To make that way for us. Paul is, I think, himself remembering all these things as he thinks about all that he is trying to endure. What did my Savior do for me? Everything. And that's why he says, I'm amply supplied. I've got all I need. Thank you for what you've given, but don't worry about me. I'm good. I've got, I'm, you know, God's taking care of me. Yeah, I know I'm in prison, but that's okay. Uh, God's got this. Wow. When suffering comes my way or your way, can we be like that? I pray we can. It's hard because I'm more like the Israelites. You remember the Israelites in Exodus? You want to know how not to respond to God? They give us a real good demonstration in Exodus. Because God got really mad at the, at the Israelites in Exodus, if you remember. They started complaining about stuff. We don't complain, though, do we? Never. Whatever. Anyway, they started complaining, and God was getting really irritated. God had done all these things to provide for them, and they started complaining. And they really got to this point where God was giving them manna. I mean, food came out of the sky every day, basically. Now, not loaves of bread. You had to make it into bread, but it came out. Of, you're in the desert. You're in the wilderness. I mean, there's nothing there. There's not trees growing around. I mean, it's just dirt. I mean, you know, rock. And this stuff falls from the sky. They're able to make food every day. And then when they need water, they go to a rock and water comes out. I mean, I mean really? They're in the desert, basically. And then they complain to God they want some meat. He's taking care of them. He's provided it. 
they start complaining. And then they start complaining against Moses and Aaron, and they start complaining. And God gets really irritated, and God's about ready to take them out. And Moses talks him out of it, is how the Scripture reads. No, God, please, please, you know, what will it say? You know, and you, you can find that in Exodus. You can find, remember the chapter off the top of my head, but you can find that in the book of Exodus. And that whole struggle, you know, God was frustrated, and it was their complaining and their lack of gratitude that was what got to the Spirit of the Almighty. I think that's a pretty good warning for me and for you. They didn't believe the fact that God would provide for them, that God cared for them. They had lost sight of that. And we do that as well at times in life. We go through struggles and difficulties. We think, God, I, I know you're there, but God, I, I don't think you understand what I'm going through. And maybe that's why he put verse 19 in this text. We're going to get to that. We're going to camp there for just a few minutes you know, and get you out of here on time. I'm going to try. Notice that's what pastors always say. We say, I'm going to try. And my God will supply all your needs in, according to his riches in the glory in Christ Jesus. He's kind of concluding this letter after all he said and all the things that they have blessed him with. And he's trying to, he's, he's bragged on them in basically verses 15 through 18, talking about the wonderful things that God has used them for, how God has used them to bless his ministry, to bless his life, that even though he finds himself in what appears to be a horrible circumstance, he is still content. He is still satisfied because God is still God. And nothing is changing that. Circumstances don't change that. My emotions don't change that. God's identity is not changed by who I think he is. He is who he is. And what I have to learn in my walk with him is to understand and believe that truth. And then he just throws this out there. And I don't know if you've ever really dived into this. And I'm going to just dive into it for just a few minutes. I don't have time to. I mean, this is a sermon in and of itself. And that scares you when a pastor says that, doesn't it? Start looking at your watch. My God will supply all your needs. Now, needs are different than wants. We know the difference of that, right? We try to teach our kids that too, right, parents? But sometimes we lose sight of the difference between needs and wants. What do I need? I need food. A certain amount of it. I need water. I need air. Anybody agree with that one? If you've ever been without it for a little bit, and some of you have been there, some of you probably feel like it with these masks on that you're without it. I know. I've heard that said. Those are needs. God provides those needs for us. He provides other things, shelter, which we, don't, we, we, we need. It's good for us, but, you know, he provides that. He provides protection. He provides all these other things. Now, our wants are a little different, aren't they? You know, I need food, but I want chocolate cake, right? You know, I need food, but I want ice cream. That makes sense to any of you? Anybody with me on that one? I mean, that's the way we are. Those are needs and wants, and we have to learn the difference in life. He doesn't say, God never says in Scripture, Mike, I'm going to give you all the ice cream you ever wanted. No, he didn't say that. I'm going to provide your needs is what he's saying here. I, my God, will supply all your needs. And what is the supply house for his needs? How, how, what does he have? Now, I don't know. I don't want you to think about this too long because it'll, it'll concern some of you. You realize that we're in some amazing weather right now. But in a few months, it's not going to be so amazing, right? This is Maryland. We all know what comes in December, January, and February, right? Can't avoid it. If you want to avoid it, you move to Florida, right? I mean, that's the way it is. You can't, it's going to happen. We can't avoid it. There will be some weather. It will get cold. There will be things that will fall from the sky or stuff water in different forms, and it will not be rain. It will be maybe sleet, ice, snow. We don't know. You know, who knows what we'll get? And it changes things, and it kind of affects the roads. Anybody ever notice how different it is to drive on dry, on dry pavement and to drive on icy pavement? You notice the difference? I prefer dry pavement myself, you know, and I saw that you probably do as well. And I, I think you probably, if you travel much in this part of the world, you like for other people to drive on dry pavement because you know they can't even drive on that. So anyway, right, you know, so let's let it drive on, on that. But the highway department has a limited supply of all the salt and chemicals and stuff they need to do the roads. Not that you've probably seen their big old bins and stuff, they have a supply. And sometimes I know when the weather's really bad, they've con kind of run short at certain times of the year in different, here and in different parts of the country. And so their supply house, is that's what they have. You see, the supply house that God has never runs out. He doesn't have a limit to his supply house. 
of what he, what he can bless you here, what, he's, what are you talking about, what he can supply for you, what he can provide for you. His, his supply house has no limits because, you know, if he runs low, he's God. He can create more, right? He's God. No limitations upon him. And the same is true not just with the physical needs, but more importantly with the um, things you face spiritually and emotionally in your life. And you think, I can't do this anymore. I, I've, I've ran out of energy. I can't do it. God can supply your needs, brothers and sisters, according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Now, what kind of riches and glory does God have? A bunch, right? Hard to fathom all that God has. And what Paul is trying to share with these believers, and he's sharing this while in prison. Remember that. I can't emphasize that enough. He's sharing this, that God can do this in your life. He can make that difference that you're, you're seeking. He can encourage you and strengthen you in the middle of what you face according to all the power that he possesses. And what he's asking you to do is to trust him. Now, I know circumstances sometimes get in the way, and we talked about that a little bit, didn't we? They kind of get our perspective off of what life really is. And sometimes we get concerned as we look at things and think, God, I don't know if you understand or you can handle the situation. It's really difficult. Well, I prefaced the children of Israel a while ago, and they were in, in a dry land where there was no water, and they found water and food. If you remember before that, they were with their backs literally against the Red Sea and Pharaoh's army coming and boiling down on them. And the only thing between them and certain death, because I don't really think they had taken weapons with them when they left Egypt and they weren't going to have any chance against Pharaoh's army, was God standing between them. And then what did God do? Well, you know, you've seen the movie or you've watched the cartoon, right? What did God do? He parted the Red Sea. He provided for them again. But he did more than just, you know, part the Red Sea and they walked through on dry land and all that they saw and how incredible that must have been. That was amazing. But when they got to the other side, he held back their enemies the whole time. That army couldn't get through. These are trained men who knew exactly how to fight a battle. They could not fight against this foe. They had nothing. Their, their spears, arrows, and all of their ability could do nothing to penetrate the power of God that was before them. They were helpless against God. And that's the way the enemy is against God, brothers and sisters. They cannot, he cannot overcome the Almighty. And so as God holds them back, they cross over, and then what does God do? You've seen it. They go in. And God told, tells Moses, these people, these Egyptians you see, you're not going to see anymore after today. You don't have to worry about them anymore. And what happens? The sea closes up and they're gone. Now that's not a, would you say that's a traditional way to fight a battle? You know, can you, is that what we see in the movies? Not usually. No, it's, you know, whatever. You would, you would have a big, you'd be a big, you know, we would have the Israelites and, and the Egyptians in massive sword play. On the, you know, that's the way, you know, in spears and all that. No, that doesn't want to happen. God fought the battle for them. And the same God that delivered them in that moment is the same God that Paul's talking about here in, he, in, in Philippians chapter 4, isn't it? That even though he is imprisoned, even though he can't do what he wants to do, he knows that God is able and God can accomplish whatever he says. And what he says here, my God shall supply your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Where do you find yourself, my friend? I don't know. We all find ourselves in different spots, but God knows and God is able to walk with you through that. And that's the hope we have as followers of Jesus Christ. That's the encouragement that we have as brothers and sisters of Jesus our Savior. Did you know that? We are members of the family of God. Jesus is the Son of God, and we are now God's children. So what does that make us to Jesus? Anyway, let's you, let just let that stew for you for a while. It's fun. And this God who is able to accomplish all these things is asking you to trust him. Just like Paul was asking the believers in Philippi to trust God, to know, I, I'm grateful, but trust God. He will accomplish what he accomplishes. And in the middle of the mess that we find ourselves in as a world and as a culture and all the things that make our life uncomfortable and different, know that God is still God and God is still in control and God will accomplish what God will accomplish as we trust him. What will it look like on the other side of this? Not a prophet? Don't know. Ain't got any for you. Can make assumptions, can make analyze, analyze, analyze things and figure some things out and make guesses because that's all they are and that's real Anything anybody else tells you, that's all it is, is a guess. And you know how often guesses are right. 
Sometimes. But you see, God knows. He never has to guess. And God knows what he's going to do with your life in the days ahead. He knows how as you trust him, how he can use you to be a light to those around you, to make a difference in the world where he's placed you as you trust him. So I guess as we we close up here, we really are, it comes down to one important question that we all have to ask ourselves pretty much every day in our walk with our Savior, which Paul, I think, answered this question pretty much from the beginning. Do we trust him with our life? We trust him with our eternal life, right? If we're a follower of Christ, we believe that God can save us from hell, right? That's what we believe. We place our trust that he can deliver us from and forgive us of our sin, deliver us from the eternal punishment of hell. He has the power to do that. We believe that. We believe the cross accomplished that. Do we believe he has enough power to do a work in our life today? Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for this word, this time. Thank you for the apostle and his incredible example. For us today, and I pray, Father, if there's one here today that has not come to know you as Lord and Savior, I pray this would be the day. If there's one that is struggling with an issue that needs some prayer and encouragement, I pray today would be a good day to to find that here. Whether they be here or on the live stream, Father, I pray, Father, that you would minister through the work of the Holy Spirit in the hearts and lives of your people to accomplish your desires in our lives. That we might learn to trust you, not only with our eternal security, but with the details of life, knowing that you are able to accomplish more than we ever imagined. Thank you for being faithful. Thank you for being king. And thank you for loving us. I ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Would you stand as we sing our time of invitation? As God has spoken today, this is your time to respond where you are. And I've got my mask if you would like to talk or pray. So feel free to come forward if you feel led to do that. Chelsea? Jesus paid it all. So much for joining us here today and for those who join us in the live stream as well we're just grateful that you're with us today and we can celebrate what god is doing in our lives so would you join me in a word of prayer and we'll let you go father we just thank you for this time we thank you for the opportunity that we have to be here and to worship you we pray that you are exalted for our time of worship that you are honored by the word that was spoken and the and the hearts that we have been uh, encouraged by your presence we thank you for all that you do bless us and keep us focused upon you we ask this in jesus name amen